Well, welcome to uh, welcome to Tom Talks. My name is Tom Simpson. I'm a research field station ecologist with the uh, Conservation District. Today, we're going on a field trip to Marengo Ridge, uh, one of my favorite places. Time for a field trip. Welcome to OMG TV. I'm Ava Lache here today with Justin Derrick, who has just completed a six month expedition to the western frontier of McHenry County. Derrick's good. Friends call me Derrick. Okay, Derrick, you've become a rock star explorer over recent years. The Tonight Show, Jimmy Kimmel, Oprah, you're really making the rounds. Tell us about your most recent adventure. We called it the Mama's Gooey Peanut Butter Expedition. And here's our sponsor, Mama, now. Make my gooey gooey really sticks to your ribs. <laughs> That's our jingle. Oh, I'm so proud of Derek. We ate it for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Comes in handy tube dispensers, just like toothpaste. Mama's gooey grape jelly in the other tube, and you're set for the day. Just keep a little bread with you. It'll help you going down better. Or you could just take a can of ready-made Mama's gooey PB&Js. Six to the can, you can store them for years. Vacuum sealed, guaranteed fresh, it's going to revolutionize eating. Really? Would you like to try one? All right. Seriously, <laughs> gooey. Well, I opened a new can on Tuesday. I reckon it's getting a bit sticky by now. So, Derek, what new discoveries did you make on your expedition? Well, I come up with a new idea where the ridge come from. The Marengo Ridge. And what's that? Ants. Lots and lots of little bitty ants. You mean? <gasps> yep. Those same little guys you see crawling on the sidewalk. Judging by how fast they make a mound in my front yard, I figure it'd take them about 30,000 years to make the ridge, not a day long. Are you serious? I'm dead serious, Ava. Them calculations is spot on. Just like gooey peanut butter. That's right, Mama. You like another, Ava? I just opened a new can. No, I mean, no thanks. Wait a second, wouldn't that take a lot of ants? I dropped a gooey PBJ on the ground one time, and when I came back the next day, I counted 347 ants on it. Eating the gooey peanut butter, I might add. Make mine gooey gooey really stick to your ribs. Can we stay focused on the ants, please? All right, Ava. Acorns and peanuts are both nuts, okay? So if there's about a million oak trees on the ridge, each tree makes about 5,000 acorns, and each acorn feeds 347 ants, There'd be about 1.7 trillion ants. Can you imagine that at a picnic? Not really. Well, thank you, Derek, and- Well, I figure- Make mine gooey gooey. You lined up 1.7 trillion ants from end to end, they'd reach to the moon and- Reporting back. from Ringwood, Illinois. Really sticks to your ribs. This is Ava Lache. Are you sure you don't want her now? Lying to send it back to the studio. Give a can in the car for emergencies. Ah! very distinctive woods and it's really only about oh maybe 50 yards from the parking area um, and what catches my eye when I walk through it is both a slightly smaller diameter of trees than I'm used to seeing in most conservation areas which means they're probably younger and the fact that there's so many that are straight and tall they all grew up together so something happened here cleared away almost all the trees probably early 20th century and when trees grow up together they shade prune one another and they grow very straight. And so we got species of trees like 
the uh, Bernard Hickley. Uh, one that uh, um, is slightly more intolerant of fires. It's one of the neat things about coming to Marengo Ridge. It's a part of a very old woodland that was huge in size. The woods would have extended for several miles to the west and the east. So we were in the middle of a really big woods. And so isolated from the, from the really harshest of the prairie fires and some species like bitternut hickory that are a little more fire sensitive persist in these woods. And each time after settlement, when fires stopped, things like bitternut hickory began to reproduce and are in fact much more common in the woods now than they would have been in the past. And that's also the, uh, the story behind red oak, which makes up almost all of the oaks in this part of the woods. The original woods here would have been mostly white oak, but red oak has gr greatly increases in number uh, after European settlement um, and the absence of fires, slightly more fire sensitive than white oaks and bur oak. So I wanted to say just a little bit about that. Um, you can see that this is the parking lot we just left. This is the boundary. Uh, and we're just outside of that boundary in that last scene in woods. This is 1939. And so we know the trees might have been started in 1939. You wouldn't see them if they were, say, five years old. So the woods date somewhere from, you know, say 1935. So you know, we're looking at woods that are somewhere around 80, 60 to 80 years old, uh, maybe a couple of years older than that. But uh, uh, a relatively young woods in comparison to this, at least many of the trees are probably in the 150 to 170, 80 year old age class of things that came up early in the 19th century. Look at a few of the ground floor plants here in the woods and some of the smaller woody plants, young trees and shrubs. Uh, even though there's not much in bloom now, right? In, in June, you go through a sort of uh, minimal period of plants coming into bloom. There's a huge burst of blooming early in the spring and there'll be another burst of blooming in a few weeks. But right now there's a sort of quiet period in the woods, but quiet though it is, it's still, it's still beautiful. We can see lots of diversity in the ground floor. We have, um, Sweet Sicily here, um, member of the carrot family, beautiful pattern to the leaves. Here is a black snake root, fairly common plant of, of our woodlands. Um, this is Virginia knotweed, uh, really common plant of our woods these days. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, here is one that's very common, but it's now in flower. And with so much of the year, we don't see this in flower. This is white havens can be a little bit weedy, but it is a native plant of our woodlands. And oh, where's, there is, um, why don't we look at this tree right here? This is, uh, this is one I couldn't do in the woody plant workshop early in the summer. This is slippery elm. And uh, slippery elm, uh, this, the slippery part of it, uh, I will demonstrate this for the, for the camera because um, lots of people don't actually know this. Uh, that the slippery part comes from the inner bark, and if you chew the twig, oh. sorry about this. This is not. A lot of those things seem so fine in detail, but once you learn these things, you see them as you're walking down the trail, and your eyes look right at right at the feature you're looking for. Here is a Here's a wonderful woodland grass. This is silky wild rye. This will come into flower later in the year. It has a wonderful uh, soft uh, fuzziness to the underside of the leaf. One of the nicest fuzzy feelings of all the plant world and in the Chicago region. You should definitely learn that one and give that a try. Um, oh, I need to point out one that you should know for your own protection. This is poison ivy. And it is quite common in our woods in the Chicago area. And uh, 
if you let all plants that have three leaves alone, then you won't, you'll have to stay in your living room because there are lots of plants with three leaves. We can learn to recognize poison ivy. Look at the irregular lobing of the leaf. Some leaves seem to have no lobes. Some of them have, look like, look like a maple leaf. Uh, but, and also notice that of the three leaves, it's the center one that has a long uh, stalk. Uh, the laterals have very little stalk. So it's that long stalk in the center the irregular lowing that should clue you. You have to learn to recognize this one instantly when you see it so you don't accidentally brush up against it. And yes, about half of you are allergic to it. I am I am allergic to it. I got a case earlier this spring. Uh, so best to avoid it even if you haven't gotten it yet. Hey Tom, I got a question for you. Yeah, what is it? Um, I the Moringa Ridge is such a striking feature. How did it get there? Like, how did it develop? Yeah, well, it's a, this is an interesting glacial feature. There really isn't any other feature in McHenry County quite like this one. The Marengo Ridge is a glacial moraine, and that moraine formed about 20,000 years ago. Uh, and so it's a, the glacier is, is advancing from east to west about 20,000 years ago. It stops right in this area, and it deposits lots of, uh, lots of glacial till. We now call that deposit the Tiscawa till. Uh, and we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Um, and then the, while, the, while the glacier is sitting on the Marengo Moraine, the ice is melting, of course, and the water is moving westward. If you look at the map, you can see the little blue arrow showing how the water goes westward, and that westward flowing glacial outwash is depositing what we call an outwash plain. So when we go west of the Marengo Moraine, it's very flat. It's really a, a, a matrix of old stream beds the Marengo Moraine itself is a very striking high feature. And as the, as the glacier retreats from the Marengo Moraine, it retreats, it readvances, deposits the Barlina Moraine, which you can see that on the map, it's a fairly minor feature. It retreats again and readvances and deposits the Woodstock Moraine, a much larger feature that's evident throughout the county from north to south. And in fact, it overlaps the Marengo Moraine up in the, up in the air of the high ridge or high point conservation area. And you can see when the moraine was sitting on the Woodstock moraine, the water was flowing westward from the ice, but the Marengo moraine was in the way, and so the water had to find a way through, and it breached the Marengo moraine in what's now the Kishwaukee River Valley, and in a few other places as you look up and down the Marengo moraine, you can see where the water sneak, cut a little path through that moraine. So that's geologically where it came from. We'll talk a little bit more about the moraine later on, but that's a sort of basic geologic history of the Marengo Moraine. So what did it look like? Well, this was, a, this was a very large woodland. I mean, a really large woodland. The woodland extended for several miles to the east and west of us here and to the south. So we're in the middle of a very large complex of woodlands. So if you keep going either direction, you get to the outwash plains of the Woodstock Moraine to the east and the outwash plains related to the to the uh, Marengo Moraine to the west. Uh, so 20,000 year old sediments to the west, about 18,000 year old sediments to the east. Both of those really flat areas were prairies. Fire moves very easily over flat areas and so they became prairies. The rough topography of the Marengo Moraine uh, hosted mostly woodlands, uh, extensively white oak woodlands in their original condition, but also red oak mixed in with them. Hey, Tom, we had a question in the chat. Hey, Tom, there's a flower over here. What's that? Oh. Go ahead. Uh, we had someone wondering, uh, tell us a little bit more about the why the slippery elm is called slippery. I think that part of the video accidentally got cut short. Okay, the slippery part is the, is the, is the gooey part that's released. Uh, it's, it's something in the inner bark of slippery elm uh, that, uh, forms a sort of mucilage in your mouth. So if you chew on a, a twig, it gets very, very gooey. And that mucilage is what coats your throat. That's the slippery part of slippery elm. The leaf is very rough. The rest of the plant, in fact, is a bit rougher. The twigs are rougher than American elm. The slippery part is the inner bark, uh, which in, traditionally was used as, as, a, as a cough medicine just to coat your throat. Well, cool, thank you. I'm sorry, some of these videos are cutting out right in the middle for some reason. Whoops. 
No, no, we want this one. That's it. Hey Tom, there's a flower over here. What's that? Oh, oh, that's a that's a beauty. Not, not a lot, not a lot of things are in bloom at this time of year, but this is a pretty one. This is a uh, foxglove beer tongue. Um, beautiful uh, uh, flower opposite, uh, what you might call opposite lanceolate leaves. Uh, beautiful. Uh, if you can see that flower. It's uh, sort of bilaterally symmetric. All the all the petals are fused into a tube. The lower limbs of the of the corolla tube are longer and arch downward. Beautiful, beautiful flower. But let's look at some other things that are, that are growing right here. They don't initially jump out to you. Here's the thicket creeper vine, this big five leaf, the compound leaves in fives. Here is the cleavers, bed straw. Uh, this is a, a wonderful plant to uh, to uh, play with your friends. Uh, it will stick to you like, uh, unfortunately, I'm not wearing uh, much in the way of cotton today, but uh, you can play uh, games with your friends. You stick it on their back, and then an hour later, someone asks them, why is there a plant stuck on your back? I'm not saying you should do that to your friends, but you just might. Here is a uh, silky wild rye again. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, oh, here is a uh, here is the wild geranium. That one is right over here. The wild geranium. Uh, finished blooming for this year. Beautiful uh, wildflower. Um, let's look on the other side of the tile and see what we can find here. This is uh, um, Looks like the hairy aster, a native white aster, fairly common, but grows in the woods and out in the open. Uh, uh, Virginia knotweed again. So that even though the, there, there is not a lot of things blooming in the woods, once you learn your flowers, and as you learn the flowers, you'll learn the leaves. And over a few years, you'll become familiar with them. Uh, and it's uh, it's just a beautiful, you don't, they don't have to be in bloom to beautify. The woods. And here's the elm leaf goldenrod, a goldenrod really characteristic of our old oak, oak savannas and woodlands. We use that a lot in our restoration efforts today. It really thrives when it's reintroduced. Um, and here is our friend poison ivy again. And here is the Virginia creeper vine looking very much like thicket creeper, but here climbing up the tree, the same five leaves, but somewhat smaller. So. We'll do that again on this trip, but there's lots and lots of diversity out here in the ground floor vegetation. Here's a really interesting feature uh, of the Marengo Ridge. Whenever you're walking in woods in the Chicago area, we, know we all love nature, and, and there's that tendency to think, well, I'm out in nature, you know, it was always this way. But the woods have changed a lot over the last few hundred years. Take these Norway spruce right here. Uh, we're, we're about, uh, the closest these grow is somewhere in uh, Northern Europe. So these were planted here by someone. Probably a home site is nearby, either to one side of this. It looks like there's a bit of a clearing to the, to the uh, southwest and maybe a little clearing to the, to the northwest. I'm not sure there was a home site very near here. Uh, and the Norway spruce were planted uh, just to beautify the home landscape. Uh, and you can see more of them as you look to the west. You can see more of them back back in the woods right now. Very deep, dark, somber, green color to Norway spruce. Well, it wouldn't be a day in the woods if Tom didn't bring out his soil auger, so he actually went back to go grab it. Found it. So what are we going to look at? So we're going to look at the soil here on the Marengo Ridge. Now this is formed in a very different glacial till from things we're used to looking at in the eastern part of the county. Uh, the soil is pretty dry and hard today, so I don't know how deep I'm going to be able to go. I'm not as young as I used to be, but we'll give it a try here. Okay, well, what about a 
as low as we can go with this soil auger. Uh, so I'm going to pull, pull this out carefully. Very, very different looking material from what I would expect to see, say, in Glacial Park in the eastern part of the county. So let's just take a look at this uh, core. Uh, I'll just remove some of these plants here so I can see it too. So if you remember from our soil workshop, the soils form is what we call the A horizon. That's a zone of organic matter. Addition and mixing from plants, mostly the grasses and sedges of the site that create um, large amounts of fibrous root systems that grow out and die back multiple times a year until they add a lot of organic matter to the soil. And that's typically in this sort of four to six inch range at the top. Here is the, the E horizon, uh, which is a zone of leaching. And so you can see it looks like it's been bleached out. It's much lighter in color than the overlying A or the underlying B horizon. Many of the clays in this area have been leached downward, leaving a very silty soil that doesn't stick together very well. So I can't make any shapes with this. It just falls apart. Now we're getting down to the B horizon, which is the zone of deposition of clays that are removed up here and they're deposited down here. And in the, the, uh, the iron oxide crystals, that give soil much of its color cling to the clay crystals so you get a zone of very intense color here it's almost brick red color this is very different you get more of an orange color in the eastern part of the county what's 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 called i believe it's the wadsworth till here this is the tiskawa till much redder in color and you can see small pebbles embedded in it a classic glacial till sediment this is an old rotting root that i went through uh as we as we go down, uh, you know, what I always do with tills is I always take a clump that I that came out of the auger and pull it apart and it will tend to break along a zone of weakness and it will expose the little pebbles that are suspended in the glacial till. Originally, this was just a mass of mud and rock being smeared on the, on the land by a glacier. Uh, it's turned into soil over the last 20,000 years. As we go down further, we can see uh, here is a, a piece of uh, dolomite that's been that's uh, just dissolved in place in the soil, leaving this big yellow stain. And as we get all the way down here to the bottom, uh, we can see this very distinctive color. Now compare this brick red color of the of the B horizon as we get down here, if not all the way to the C horizon zone of Paramatola, we're getting close and you can see we're getting, this is close to the color of the original till. Very distinctive pinky kind of color. You just don't see this anywhere else in the Chicago region. So if you can't get excited about this, I guess you just can't get excited about soil. Um, so this is the, the Tiskawa till. It has a has sort of a clay loam texture, so I can mold it pretty well and I can make it into shapes. Uh, very easily, unlike the E horizon that was just um, just all silt. Uh, the B horizon would do that also. It's just a little bit drier here. We're starting to pick up more water at the bottom, uh, so I can't really shape the B horizon very well. So this is a, a, a first of all a classic well-drained woodland soil. If you remember the bright colors in the B horizon signify a soil that that weathered where there was lots of oxygen present in the soil, meaning that this soil is very rarely saturated with water. We're up on top of a hill, the water can run off in a number of different directions, so the water doesn't stand here. And we develop this very brightly colored B horizon, bright if, as soon as you retune your eyes to, to the colors of soil. This is a very brightly colored soil, uh, becoming much more bland in color here in the E horizon because the clay crystals and the pigments have been leached out accumulate here and become lighter in color here as we get back really toward the color of the original glacial till parent material. So an exciting, exciting soil. Look at the woods around here and it's mostly white oaks, the big, tall, uh, gr scaly, gray barked trees. As you pan around, you can see white oak dominates the woods. There are some red oaks mixed in here. This is a classic marina woodland 
in the Chicago area, dominated by right oak, white oak, originally with a much lesser amount of red oak. The red oak has increased since European settlement and the various disturbances to the woods during that period of time. But this is just a beautiful, classic uh, white oak woodland on a glacial moraine. Oh, this is a, a map of the uh, cross section of McHenry County and the red arrow is where where we are today on, on the Marengo Ridge. And you can see that huge deposit of the Tiscowitz Hill that is uh, over a hundred feet thick. And in fact, it underlies areas even in the eastern part of the county, but it's an older deposit. And so it's, it's covered over by more recent tills or glacial outwash from more recent stages of glaciation. What I wanted to point out to you are a few plants here, and each one of these plants tells a different story about the wood. Here is our native yellow, yellow honeysuckle, a sort of viney plant. Doesn't, they're not a high climbing vine. Um, you hear it here twining around itself, these opposite, almost round or orbicular leaves, uh, not hairy at all. Uh, if you plant this in your backyard, it'll grow up on a trellis and it will have spectacularly beautiful flowers. But here in the woods, in the shade of the woods, it very rarely flowers. So what this is telling us is that these plants established uh, in a past when these woods are much more open. They're left behind today, sort of relics of the past, and they can no longer flower anymore. The, uh, the prickly uh, right here is also a native shrub of the oak woods of, of, of McHenry County. But probably if you, I don't know if you can tell this from, from the camera, but there's just thousands of stems of it in the woods right here. And most likely because it is, it is prickly, this one increased in its population during the farming and grazing era when cows obviously wouldn't eat this as much because it's very prickly and the leaves have a very a sort of like lemon or a orange rind pungency to that probably that doesn't taste very good to cattle. So that one probably increased during the farming era. The yellow honeysuckle was a native vine that's just hanging on. The uh, choke cherry over here is a, well, it's not super common and it's not really uncommon. Uh, this is one that uh, unfortunately uh, most people don't recognize. So when they're removing buckthorn and honeysuckle, they often get rid of this thinking it's a buckthorn, but it's not, this is the native Choke cherry, uh, it grows as a clone, so you see several stems coming up right here. Uh, this is easy to tell apart from uh, buckthorn because of the very sharply toothed uh, leaves, the surface, uh, the veins are impressed. It has a sort of dull upper surface and the leaves are a little bit wider out toward the tip. So choke cherry, beautiful native shrub, one of my favorites uh, in the Chicago area woodlands. our native shrubs already, but I just wanted to reinforce this. This is one of the wonderful things about the ridge is just the richness of the native shrub layer. That's often uh, one of the things that's that's most lacking in many of the woods in the Chicago area, probably the long history of grazing uh, and then the in incursion of exotic uh, trees and shrubs shaded out that, that native shrub layer. But here we've just got a whole variety. And I mentioned a few already, the prickly ash, probably which even increased during the farming era. Here is nanny berry, pretty common viburnum in the, in the Chicago area, particularly in McHenry County. Here's gray dogwood, another common shrub. But again, it's not just any one of these. It's the rich diversity that you find in the woods. Here we've got elderberry again on this side. Again, one you usually think you're gonna see more in, uh, in wetter situations, but here it's thriving in the relatively dry woods of Marengo Ridge. And there's one herb up here I really wanted to point out because you don't see it very often. This is poke milkweed. Most of us are familiar with a common milkweed that's a weed in farm fields uh, and famously is one of the major food sources for monarch butterfly larvae. This is another milkweed, same genus, same milky sap, serves that same function in terms of the host plant for uh, for the monarch larvae, but, uh, but much more rare 
and a, and a plant of our woodlands, not of open sunny areas. And you can see that the umbel of flowers is looser, not as many flowers when they open up, they won't be that pink. They will be a very light pink, the very light purple and white, even light green colors in the flower. They don't jump out at you in the woods, but it's a really nice, just a beautiful, relatively rare native wildflower of our woods. Um, and uh, we saw a jack in the pulpit over here. Do we remember where that was? You can back here. Okay. Oh, here it is. Um, jack in the pulpit is another one of those plants that gives a lie to the idea of leaves of three, let it be. There are many plants with leaves of three. This is one of them, jack in the pulpit. Look at the beautiful venation of the leaf, the asymmetry of those lateral leaflets and, and the, uh, the uh, bilateral symmetry of the terminal leaflet. Just a beautiful pattern of Jack in the Pulpit. And here are the maturing fruits that are variously reported anywhere from deadly poisonous to only mildly poisonous. Uh, but the word poisonous attached to them means I've really never given them a try and never never will. So this is not one, it will, they will turn brilliant uh, red. So. It may attract you someday. This is not one to try and taste. Oh, and here is a, a, a plant very characteristic uh, of our of our oak uh, oak savanna woodland flora. This is uh, the horse gentian, or the perfoliate leaved horse gentian. You can see interestingly how the two leaves come together, fuse together, and the stem seems to punch a hole through the middle of that leaf. That's called a perfoliate arrangement. Uh, this is Triostem perfoliatum, a uh, plant really characteristic of our of our oak, open oak woodlands of the past, surviving into the present year. So again, rich, rich uh, floral diversity of Marengo Ridge. So you mentioned earlier that there was some evidence of grazing with all the prickly ash here earlier. What else do you see that tells you there was grazing? That's a good question. Um, you know, that, that's an, an era in the history that was that lasted for over a century. We close to a century and a half in many of the woods in the Chicago area, maybe not that long in other, other parts of the Chicago area. But it left a huge imprint on the woods. And unless you can learn to recognize that, you don't really know what parts of the woods are telling you about a distant past what parts are telling you about a very recent past and what parts are telling you about the agriculture era. So plants like the, uh, the uh, we had a white snake root here, Eupatorium rugosum, is poisonous to many animals. So it tends to be one of the last things that cows will eat. And that's that's a theme you'll, you'll hear repeated when people talk about uh, grazing uh, indicators is that if, an, if the cows won't eat it, it tends to increase in population size. Things that cows like to eat tend to decrease in population size. So white snake root was an increaser. Uh, where was it? Here it was. Increaser under population. Likewise, the black cherry, very common tree. Look at the glistening, the glist, how the light glistens off the upper waxy upper surface of the leaf. Much, uh, much shinier than choke cherry, which has a dull upper surface. This one grows into a medium size to large tree. Uh, and both of them share the, uh, the toxic uh, uh, chemical cyanide, which uh, forms when, a, when an animal starts to chew up the leaves and twigs. There are two, two chemicals held in vacuoles in the cells. And when the animal chews up the leaf, it crushes those vacuoles. The two chemicals mix and form cyanide. And you can smell that when you smell the twig of a black cherry. You scratch and sniff the sweating and you'll get that bitter odor and it's the odor of hydrocyanic acid uh, in, in those kind of quantities it's not going to hurt you so again cows try to avoid this if, if you get enough cows in and there's so little to eat they'll start to eat this stuff but they can actually die from eating black cherries so two plants that try to deter uh, um, eating by cattle with poisonous foliage. Other plants like the blackberry here uh, do it with pickles. And so uh, blackberries are famously the bane of, of ranchers who are, who are trying to graze their, 
cattle. These will invade pastures and the clumps just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're densely beset by these large thorns and ward off the, uh, the livestock. And so you have to end up going and herbiciding or even taking them out with a bulldozer uh, to clear the pasture again. We have its sort of little brother here, the black, uh, the black raspberry, the thorns a little bit less, uh, but also a thorny plant and one that would ward off at least some of the grazing. So it doesn't mean that every one of these plants is going to be overpopulated anytime you graze livestock. When you keep all these plants in mind and you see one or more of them overpopulated in the woods, like the prickly ash is here, it's telling you about that grazing history. Here is the prickly ash again over here. Again, prickly and, and combined prickles with the chemicals in the leaf that give it that really pungent, rather nasty taste. I don't know if it's poisonous. I don't think so, but it might be uh, probably cows just simply don't like to eat it. So just, just a few of the plants that really tell you about the, uh, the grazing era history of these woods. And you can also, when we look at aerial photographs, uh, you can see this, the, right, the straight lines and right angled openings that are created in the woods by farmers and Europeans. You know, we, we do things on squares and right angles. And so you clear a field and you clear a rectangle so you can run the tractor along rows parallel to the long side. So those are the kinds of openings you see in the woods. And whenever you see a long straight line in the woods, you know that's a recent, a recent origin and a product of the agricultural and grazing era. around in the woods here you see a lot you see first of all that it seems darker uh, much more shade in this area and when we start looking at the trees we find that they're all basswoods there's some older red oaks around but lots and lots of these young well younger basswoods probably within the last 50 or 60 years and it would appear you can see how straight a very little branching there is on those trees as they go up they probably all came up together within the last 50 or 60 years and they're creating a lot of shade and you can see the height of the ground layer of vegetation has gotten much shorter and we see things like the enchanter's nightshade super common plant of really shady woods in the county uh greatly increasing in numbers the uh the jack in the pulpit, another one of our native flowers that can survive in very little sunlight. That's really the overall reduction in height of the ground floor here, just simply because there's really not a lot of light to work with. Again, this is the fun thing about, about forests and woods to me, is walking through them and you can see their history written in the shapes and forms and sizes of the trees. Hey Tom, we had a question in the chat. In a place where a tree came down, you never want to pass up an opportunity. Go ahead. Is black walnut harmful coming into a property of white oak? Uh, no, I mean black walnuts are, are around. That's that's a species that we're very uncertain where it fit into the landscape 300 years ago. It was it's a native species. Uh, but it doesn't show up in the public land survey notes uh, much at all. So it's undoubtedly much more common today. It's another plant that whose foliage is quite, uh, well, cows just don't like to eat it. So it probably did increase in, in uh, frequency during the grazing era. And it mixes in with oaks. It really doesn't hurt them. It's not, uh, I mean, I know there's a lot made of the allelopathy, the chemicals released by black walnuts that deter the growth of at least certain other plants and that's a true uh, phenomena but it doesn't it if you look under black walnuts at Marengo Ridge there are lots and lots of plants growing there and I don't, I don't think anyone has ever suspected they were deterring oak reproduction um, so they're not really hurting anything there are probably a lot more black walnuts at Marengo Ridge and in many of our natural areas today than there used to be but they're not a harmful species it's just one more one more of the native hardwood species of our area Thank you. Opportunity to look at the soil. This is one I got to spend any energy to do. So this uh, tree is part of what looks like an old willow that came down uh, 
So we can see the, uh, the pink color of the Tisco Tills here. You can see the suspended pebbles. Characteristic of glacial tills is a perfect example of that. This is poison ivy right here to which I am allergic. So I'm very aware of where my hands are going right now. Uh, just the angular fragments of, of rock that were broken up by the glacier and then left behind. Uh, so we've got the poison ivy here. We've got uh, a little bit of slippery elm coming in right along the side here. Here's, uh, we've mentioned some of these already. This is the, uh, the elm leaf goldenrod. This is, uh, this is a little plant you probably got growing in your yard. It's the, uh, one of our European oxalis uh, shrubs, very common exotic plant uh, of lawns, but you do find in the woods also, if you get a chance to taste it, it has a wonderful um, tangy, uh, acid in there, oxalic acid, which is the same acid you get in fresh spinach. It gives that little tanginess to it. So here's a nice example of the Tiscoa till, and we didn't even have to dig a hole for it. So uh, we're going to take just a couple minute break here. You can stretch your legs, and we're in, next we're going to get a treat. We're going to listen to John Peters talk about ecological restoration management at Marengo Ridge. So Jenny had a question. Yeah. Have you noticed in your woodland hikes any Native American trail marker trees in McHenry? I've heard there's supposed to be one at High Point. Uh, well, there may be. Uh, that's that's not an area of my expertise. Probably Ed Collins could answer that question a lot better than I could. Uh, I've certainly seen a lot of oddly shaped trees, uh, and uh, Native Americans did bend them. Uh, into strange shapes to mark trails. I'm not sure which ones of those that I've seen are trail markers and which ones are just oddly shaped trees, but uh, it's a good question. Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to ask Ed about that one. I believe there is one at Coral Woods that kind of just looks like a right angle zigzag. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty, but uh, not know exactly where that is. <laughs> okay, go. Well, we'll uh, You want to uh, just take a minute now, or do you want to? Uh, I can certainly field more questions if, if people would like to ask. I'm sorry that some of those videos, and I, I was fighting with that yesterday, some of those videos just stop in the middle, uh, and it's hard to get them to play through. I'm not, not quite sure what, what went wrong there, but uh, or they'll do it when I'm watching, but when I, the next time I try, <laughs> they malfunction. So, uh, yeah, any questions you've got right now? We're, we're going to sort of change topics here in the next uh, 20 minutes. Okay, well, we can, we can move ahead now if you think we, are we ready, Jackie? Um, we just had a question come in. What? Is the flowering plant all over Marengo white petals, yellow center, about three to four feet tall? White petals, yellow center, three to four feet tall. Hmm. Well, I can't. We had a picture of it after, you know, after we're finished with the presentation. Hey, if you could show me a picture, I could probably tell you, but I can't. I can't recognize it by that description. I'm sorry. Uh, have any pictures or info on like the number of petals um if you have an idea of what family it might fall in the shape of the leaves those would be helpful characteristics or where it's growing if it's in a wet area or dry area another question um i was at rollins savannah yesterday i see their soil is primarily rich dark soil why is this so in contrast to the clay soils of McHenry? Well, I'm not quite sure where you were in Rollins Savannah. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of difference in the, in the soils of the Marengo Moraine or the, you know, the Tinley or Valparaiso Moraine of, of Lake County. Or, um, th there are differences that I can see in the soil. It's mostly just the peculiar color of the, from the Tiscola Till. But uh, overall, the soils are pretty similar. If you get in a, in a, a lower, more, more, where we looked at that soil, you know, a few minutes ago, that was a dry, rich environment uh, 
Um, and in those, the, this, particularly as the surface soil dries out, it looks sort of, sort of grayish brown in color. If you came back after a rain, it would be much darker. And if you got, we're gonna look at a soil here in just a few, uh, at the end of the presentation, not, not in, in John's part of the presentation, but at the end of it, I'm gonna look at a soil in a lower area uh, along a stream, you'll see a much, uh, much richer looking soil, uh, more like the soil you might wanna plant tomatoes in. But uh, yeah, the soils are not terribly different between the two. Uh, yeah, I, I think Rollins Savannah, I've been there, but I'm, I think it was, it's a morainal landscape, which would be somewhat different from say, Eastern McHenry County, where you have mostly a, or a lot of gravelly soils, gravelly and sandy soils, which would be different just because of their parent material. So yeah, they're, they're probably the soil types in Lake County and McHenry County overlap about 85% and there are a few in either that are, that are distinct. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but yeah. Cool, thank you. I'm gonna give it another minute here if anybody has other questions and then we'll start up again. had a comment. Some of our young white oaks are yellowed and right next to them are green. Any idea what that might be? Well, yellowing with white oak is generally a, a sign of chlorosis and uh, I don't if these are planted or, or not if they're white oaks very pH sensitive so if this if, uh, if it's I mean, this can be, the, can be the only reason why this happens but I it will happen if the soil uh, if you're next to gravel or, or a sidewalk or when you're near buildings, you can be near fill and uh, crushed rock, uh, all of which, you know, if it's crushed dolomite limestone, uh, will raise the pH of soil. And if it gets much above seven, uh, the white oak can't pick up enough um, iron and magnesium to form chlorophyll, so the leaves go yellow. Uh, so it's one of those species that uh, really can't grow in alkaline soils. Baroque is much, much, uh, more amenable to growing in either acid or alkaline soils. Uh, white oak is really a, an acid to neutral um, soil plant. So I suspect, though I can't tell without looking at the situation, that the, it's a soil problem. Uh, yeah, probably if it's near homes, it's probably has to do with development uh, and building and you know bulldozers pushing stuff around and leaving some gravel here and there. Uh, yeah, that would be my best guess. All right, and this is the last question before we'll start up again. Um, there's loads of milkweed at Marengo. Was there a planting in the past? Uh, loads of milkweed. Well, I didn't, of course, in the woodland walk I was on, I didn't see that. Uh, I mean, any milkweed, common milkweed is just a very common plant. There are, there are masses of it in that, particularly in areas where you have disturbed the soil. If you take an area of uh, of perennial grasses and uh, disturb the grasses, though you'll find milkweeds popping up everywhere. We have fields of them near Lost Valley Visitor Center in an old uh, pasture area we cut for hay uh, for grass and birds each year. So it's a pretty common plant uh, when you get out into open sunny areas. And we're where we're not like farmers now, where we're not uh, we're not herbiciding to try to eliminate those broadleaf plants. So milkweeds are pretty common. I don't think, I don't think they've been planted, at least not in mass at Marengo Ridge. I think they're probably just coming up naturally. The only milkweed planting I can think of was last year. Um, I think the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had some extra milkweeds that we planted at Alden, uh, Alden Gap site, yeah. uh, but really we focus more on tree plantings, not so much the milkweeds. I think we're all set to move on to the next part. So go ahead. 
We got a treat here. We're gonna we're gonna hear about the management of Marengo Ridge. Hello, uh, I'd like to introduce John Peters, who's uh, been an ecologist with the Conservation District, directing the management here at Marengo Ridge for many years. So, hey there, John. Hey, Hi, Tom. How are you? Um, welcome to Marengo Ridge. Uh, Marengo Ridge is uh, one of our Conservation District sites we have here in the county. It's uh, 793 acres, plus or minus, just a little bit. Um, and uh, it was once part of what we call the Big Woods. Uh, and the Big Woods was a, a oak woodland uh, that was here pre-settlement uh, times uh, that was about 28,000 acres, plus or minus a little bit, um, that went all the way from here at, uh, at Marengo Ridge, uh, right uh, by the, the river, Kishwaukee River, all the way up to Harvard and all the way over to, to Brookdale where our Conservation District Brookdale offices are. Uh, it was composed of basically white oaks uh, and bur oaks uh, and reds and blacks. It has all sorts of walnuts in there. So there's a, a multitude of, of species that are, are were adapted by the, the soils that were here. And uh, so we're gonna do a quick little uh, virtual uh, tour of, uh, of Moringo Ridge here and talk about some of the, the things that uh, the landscape has gone under. Um, so it went from, you know, being a big woods of 28,000 acres uh, to small little fragmented little little pieces of, of woodland that were left. And so we're, we're in the process now of, of restoring that uh, woodland and uh, just part of our, our uh, program that we're doing here at the Conservation District. So one of the tools that we use for, for land management and land management history is, is basically the computer. And we're using a, a software called ArcGIS, and we basically have a lot of different layers that we have accumulated over time that we're able to uh, look at and help uh, analyze the landscape. Uh, so one of the layers that we have here is, is basically the, the soil types. So we're able to uh, utilize the, the soil maps uh, that are here in McHenry County, and you can determine what um, what native vegetation basically helped develop that soil. So there's a lot of things that go into soil development, and Tom, of course, knows more about soils than I do, uh, but uh, there's all sorts of different soil types that kind of dictate what natural communities grow on them. Uh, so here in Maringo Ridge, we have uh, a little bit of grassland soils, uh, a lot of uh, uh, woodland soils. Uh, some of our, it is, uh, you know, dry or, or mesic, mesic woodland or mesic savanna uh, soils. and. Um, we also have some wetter areas too. So we, there are some hydric soils that are here in Marengo Ridge that are mostly along kind of the drainage ways or in the, in the lower spots. And most of those were either either sedge meadow or somewhat of a, a combination of a, of a wet woods or, or wet, wet prairie that were kind of isolated drainage ways uh, here in, on the Marengo Moraine or here at Marengo Ridge. Uh, so those, that's one of the, the tools we use is, is the soil maps. And then we also, uh, with our GIS uh, program that we use, we have access to all the different, or some of the different historical uh, plat books of who owned the land when. And so I'm actually looking at one now, it's from uh, 1862, and uh, shows basically Marengo Ridge as being all wooded. And there's uh, you know uh, quite a, a number of uh, landowners here, but really not really quite divided. And then, uh, so it's basically all still pretty wooded. As we go closer to our time with the air photos and with the plat book stuff, our next one is 1872 uh, that we have. And the landscape on that plat book shows uh, a lot of really interesting features. It shows who actually owned the land, uh, if there was like an orchard or if there was um, a spring, or you can see some of the hydrology things that are, that are uh, on the map. Uh, so it kind of shows more of, of, you know, as the technology was uh, getting a little more advanced with, with uh, the land use history here in McHenry County, uh, you can see how that landscape changes changes over time. So we're gonna, we're, I'm looking at the 1862 and the 1872 plat book, uh, and then we kind of jump ahead in our, our time up to another period in time where we have a really good air photo and that's from 1939. And in 1939, you can see the landscape changes, especially here at Marengo Ridge from where it was a big big woods uh, before to now there's isolated little pockets of high quality woodland that are, are left. And a lot of the 
lot of what was here at Marengo Ridge, I would say probably a good 70% of Marengo Ridge here uh, was logged. And some of it uh, was logged very intensely and sometimes they would log and then change the land use. So they would convert it into a hay field or into a crop field. Uh, other times they would just let the woods grow back. And so we have some of our, our woodland here in, in Marengo Ridge has been cut but only one time. So there's a lot of trees that are here in Moringo Ridge, uh, especially the oak trees on the northern uh, part of the nature trail loop that are multi-trunked. So you can tell that they were, were cut and logged and then they are growing back with either two trunks or three trunks out of out of one, one spot. So, and they're all the same age class trees. And so you can see the difference in the landscape history by just looking at what tree species are there um, and, and how, how that occurs. So one of the other um, air photos that we do have is from 1954. And from 1954, most all the logging had, had stopped uh, here in Marengo Ridge. And you can see some of the, the regrowth of some of those areas that were not uh, converted into agricultural purposes, but were left as a woods. And you can see some of their, their, their growth coming back. And then you can look at a, you know, even closer air photos to our time into the, into the 1988 is a real good one. We have a 1999 air photo and then a series of them all the way through, uh, through now. So we'll, uh, one of the pictures we have is basically what it looks like today. So we have a 2018 air photo that we'll be showing you and just to see how the landscape has changed over time and, and what we're able to do on, on the property to try to, you know, reintroduce some of the, the uh, woodland species. Uh, we're doing a lot of tree planting here on the site. Uh, so uh, very interesting site uh, that, that uh, Moringa Ridge uh, is, and uh, it's gone through some pretty neat history. And uh, like I said, it still looks like a, a woodland and a lot of it still is. Uh, some of it is just a little, little more disturbed or a lot younger than some of the older growth uh, woodland that we have here in Moringa Ridge. So one of our other management tools that we have here for Marengo Ridge is, is basically our volunteer program. So we had over the, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, we've had a, a, a few uh, site stewards that have done some real active land management uh, on, on the site. And we've uh, tailored them to work in some of our areas where we have some remnant oak communities that are left. And so we've had them uh, work on, on some of the, the uh, management tasks that are, are part of, of this too. So a big part of what we have uh, is, as far as management is is our volunteer program that we have here. So we have a, a volunteer steward, uh, his name is Dale Shriver, who works on, on the property here. And he's been working on the property for over 20 years uh, and has, has been a great uh, resource for us as far as uh, site surveillance, but then also helping and assisting with our, our land management work that we've done here on the site. Uh, so just want to mention one of our other management tools that we use are people and uh, the volunteer program here at Moringa Ridge has been a, a, a very key component to what management work has been done here on the site. I just wanted to uh, mention one other steward, a younger, younger fellow, actually a former college intern of mine, I think from the class of 2013. Uh, who lives uh, uh, in, the, in that uh, area, and his name is Kevin Kucharski, who works alongside Gail and, or Dale, um, and uh, yeah, just another important part of stewardship at, at the Ridge. So this is one of the areas that we have in here in Marengo Ridge where we're doing active land management now. Uh, so we've done some selective clearing in this area here uh, behind me uh, uh, two winters ago. And so this is the second year of a herbicide application uh, in this woods. And as you can see, there's a lot of green that's on the ground already. There's some uh, pine trees and some walnuts and, and some oaks that are kind of migrating themselves out from the big woods, which is behind us this way. So I don't know if you want to pan that way real quick and see the difference between what this looks like and what it looks like directly to the west. You can see in the west we have a, a different assemblage of trees. We have a lot of white oaks and red oaks uh, that are in in the woods here behind uh, where we're looking at. And if you scroll back this way, there's a little bit of a, a transition zone here on the edge where we have a lot of hawthorns. Uh, we do have uh, you know, some 
oak trees that are out here, and then we actually have some pines that were obviously planted uh, by, by uh, Cubans in here. And then we've got a lot of uh, walnuts and um, you know, other species that are, are in here. So this is a place where we're actively doing management right now. Uh, we've had a, uh, a, one of our crew members has been in here for the last month or so doing herbiciding on this probably five or six acre uh, location. And uh, so this is one of the places where we're doing active management right now. So I'm standing here right on, on basically the edge of, of what the old remnant woods was and then behind over this way where there's a different plant assemblage where we have uh, different, basically different trees that are growing here. So I'm standing on well, pretty close to where the original fence line used to be. And as you can see, we've got a big old glacial erratic and there's some other big rocks here that may kind of make sense that you know, if a farmer has these big rocks out in the field, what do they do is they will move them off to the side of their big field so their tractor doesn't hit the rocks. And so along old fence lines, and we can see that this is probably where the old wood starts because we've got really, really big white oak trees on this side and behind me and in a straight line going down to the south. And over this way, there's, there's a, you know, assemblage of, of white oaks and walnuts and black oaks and, um, you know, fir oaks that are here. And on this side of the tree line, we've got a different plant assemblage. And so that plant assemblage is, is basically from succession. And so if you have a field edge, what usually happens first is you get tree species that will move in that field edge and move, move further the way in. So on, on this east side of this white oak old fence line, we do have an assemblage of a lot of uh, basically red oaks, trees that are um, more, uh, aggressive in their in their growth cycle with with op more open conditions, and so there's a different different age class from these big white oaks, right, to uh, oaks that are are still probably 60 years old or so, maybe 70, but they're not the 160 year old or 180 year old or 200 year old oaks uh, that are along the fence line and that are in part of this big woods here. So it's kind of interesting to see the dynamic or the uh, how you know, kind of reading the landscape of what what has happened on this site, and why why there's big trees here, and over here there's little trees. And we know that's just because of the land use history that, that's occurred on the site. I wanted to, uh, yeah, this is really sort of the equivalent place to where we started off that very first stop when we left the parking lot. Um, same age, same condition back in the in the 30s. Uh, and they've both probably grown in together, probably one long uh, area paralleling the old woods to the west uh, that has developed over the last 80 years or so. It's always interesting to see that phenomenon of change and how some plants can be very common in the old woods and yet not move out of them, whereas some plants like red oak very aggressively moved out of the woods into that uh, area once they'd stopped uh, stopped farming. They had a question in the chat. Okay. What would they be herbiciding as part of management? Probably much of the herbiciding is was it's you're, you're following up uh, cutting and so uh, either by machine or by hand a lot of the invasive uh, um, honeysuckles and uh, um, buckthorn and uh, multiflor rose uh, and autumn olive and those sort of woody invasives would have been cut uh, and they will and probably they tried to herbicide the stumps but you always miss quite a few and so they have to come in repeatedly and try to catch the re-sprouts and herbicide those. I would suspect that was 98 percent of what they were herbiciding uh, along the edge of a woods like that. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to switch presentations again and we're going to go back to our walk uh, in the woods. Um, row three, there we go.
So one of the things I really haven't dwelt on, uh, but um, fire is both important to the current management of Marengo and, and other natural areas in the county. Whenever we uh, commit ourselves to ecological restoration, we have to commit ourselves to a burning program. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because fires are, have been a common part of the, the history of Marengo Ridge and other natural areas, Chicago area, for uh, all 10, 11, 12,000 years. Uh, human beings brought fire with them when they came to the Chicago area and indigenous cultures have used fire as they interacted with the landscape for, for a very, very long period of time, which changed the vegetation. And what we think of as Illinois as the natural Illinois, the Illinois of the pre-European past was, was another sort of cultural landscape, uh, what I like to call a co-production of nature and culture. And so that's, that's, that's the world we're thinking of when we do conservation and restoration, what we call native plants are plants that inhabited that landscape, what we call native birds are those that thrive in that landscape. And those are the things we're trying to do. So, so both our current management, ecological restoration or removal of exotic weeds, our use of fire is all a part of trying to piece by piece um, understand how the landscape today is different from the past and reintroduce some of the influences, some of the plants and some of the animals that were a part of the past to try to try to make an ecosystem today or try to influence the development of an ecosystem today that 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 contains many of those elements of the past that we value so much. And I wanted to point out to you are a few plants here. Each one of these plants tells Okay. Go ahead. Are there any conservation sites where trees are tagged and monitored for growth or other reasons? Well, um, I mean, we do, I just completed a resurvey in Glacial Park after 33 years. <laughs> Um, in a sense, that's a study of change over time. Uh, maybe I'll maybe we'll do a time talk on that. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting long-term study. We are inter we are we have already have some studies in place of what we're planting. You know, we go out and plant a lot of oaks and hazel. We survey their height and then come back later to see how they've grown, how much deer browse has affected them, how much are some of our our wire cages we put around them, how effective are they, and fostering the high growth of those plants. So we are, we are certainly monitoring uh, those areas and we, we, have, we have at least some repeat studies of the older woods and how it's changing over time. Thank you. So, what I wanted to point out to you are a few plants here. Each one of these plants tells a different story about the wood. Here is our native yellow, yellow honeysuckle, a sort of viney plant. Doesn't, they're not a high climbing vine. Um, you hear here twining around itself, these opposite, almost round or orbicular leaves, uh, not hairy at all. Uh, if you plant this in your backyard, it'll grow up on a trellis and it will have spectacularly beautiful flowers. But here in the woods, in the shade of the woods, it very rarely flowers. So what this is telling us is that these plants are established uh, in a past when these woods are much more open. They're left behind today, sort of relics of the past, and they can no longer flower anymore. The, uh, the prickly ash uh, right here is also a native shrub of the oak woods of, of, of McHenry County. But probably if you, I don't know if you can tell this from, from the camera, but there's just thousands of stems of it in the woods right here. And most likely because it is it is prickly. This one increased in its population during the farming and grazing era when cows obviously wouldn't eat this as much because it's very prickly and the leaves have a very uh, sort of like lemon or uh, orange rind pungency to that probably that doesn't taste very good to cattle. So that one probably increased during the farming era. The yellow honeysuckle was a native vine that's just hanging on. The uh, choke cherry over here So what I want to do here is to look at the soil again. Now we should be in basically the same parent material. This whole whole uh, whole natural area here is uh, is, is uh, developed on on the Marengo Moraine, and which is composed of the 
Fisker wood tail I mentioned earlier, that nice reddish color that we saw in the last one. But here we're in a much lower area. There's a little stream right next to us. Uh, very little uh, relief, uh, pretty flat. So we would expect to see some indication of wetness in the soil. So we'll start start a soil. We'll take me a few minutes to dig it. We'll, uh, we'll compare this to the last soil we looked at a few minutes ago. So here we're going to take a look at the soil we removed here, and not far from the stream, in this relatively flat area here at Marengo Ridge. Uh, and we can see, first of all, this looks very different from the soil we did in the upland. I apologize for the bright sunlight and shadows. I can't turn the sun down. But we have an, an A horizon, a zone of organic matter mixing. It's going down well over 10 inches now in a sort of classic soil taxonomy, you'd call that a grassland. So I think we got a number of things going on. This is obviously not a grassland. This is a former, or is a, is a woodland site now, and it was a woodland site in the past. But we've got here two things going on. First of all, uh, when this stream floods, we have some deposition of sediments here. So we have some addition by deposition. And also the site is much, much moister than the upland site where we first worked so the plants, the ground layer plants are more productive. There's more organic matter being added to the soil and in wetter soils, the uh, organic matter decomposes more slowly. So all those things work together to create a thicker, uh, darker A horizon. As I said in the soil workshop a few weeks back or a month ago, and look at the whole situation here and not just look at any one factor. Yes, it's a deep A horizon. We have a number of contributing factors to this that this would develop in a woodland situation. We have the alluvial addition by flooding and we have simply the fact that this is a wetter site and all of the things being equal, the wetter site has a deeper A horizon than the drier site. Simply a matter of plant productivity, particularly in the rooting zone that, that adds that organic matter. We have here a sort of transition between the that large A horizon and the B horizon. This is very clay, sticky, easy to mold. So it's really not an E horizon. It's simply a transition between the A and the B. Uh, and if we get down here into the B horizon, we can see uh, colors. I wish I could put the, uh, the soil of the first one right next to this, but that was, uh, that was over an hour ago. Uh, as I look at this closely, I can see some modeling some variation from bright colors and somewhat more dull colors, which is what you would expect here in this situation. This isn't flooded for long periods of time, but it is saturated uh, as you get a little, little bit below the surface for at least uh, many weeks during the springtime, just because of its topographic situation. Again, developed in the Tiscawa Till, and you can see here are the rocks. Here's a beautiful piece of chert. Uh, very common rock to find in our glacial tills. It breaks like a piece of glass on these sort of arcing conchoidal fractures. There's a beautiful piece of chert from the original Tiscawa tills. But this soil developed and it shows both the influence of the addition of organic matter at the surface and of the wetness, seasonal wetness down below where we have a little modeling and a little bit of the appearance of those dull colors. If you remember, the dull colors are indicating poor oxidation the iron compounds that form where there's very little oxygen tend to be gray in color, uh, gray and very dull colors. And so we'll get that uh, showing up down here in the B horizon. So uh, nice contrast to that first soil we saw up above. So I wanted to stop here to, uh, to look at this ephemeral stream, stream valley. It's really characteristic of the marine on the rain. Now, many of the smaller ephemeral stream valleys at this time of year are, are obscured by the ground vegetation. If we had done this trip in the winter, we could have seen every little little, uh, little valley, uh, very characteristic of this area because water, uh, let's think about the eastern part of the county where usually there's a lot of gravel, loose gravel under the surface. Even if the surface has a glacial hill layer under it, Here, the water starts to go into this 
glacial till, but pretty soon it's, it's virtually impermeable to water movement. It moves laterally and then it comes out in, in, in these uh, depressions along the slope and starts to flow downward. Now, in this case, we've got an exaggeration of it with some recent disturbance. We'll talk about this in just a minute. But that's a characteristic form of the Marengo Moraine. A lot of surface drainage patterns, you'll see that in the map that shows all those little patterns. That's how you can recognize a glacial moraine is looking for that pattern of surface, surface drainage. Very different from ice contact landscapes. Let's go down and take a look at this, at this uh, stream channel a little bit more closely. And I'll try to do this without falling. deep we got. Well, here we're, we're cutting into the same stuff, only I didn't have to dig a hole here. Uh, this is just the same uh, exposure of the Tiscoa Hill. Uh, um, play long, little suspended uh, pebbles in there. Uh, this particular sample has a little bit more sand in it than some of the other we've looked at. But you can see here the uh, pebbles a variety of sizes that were suspended in the till as the clays and silts wash away it leaves these pebbles behind here a piece of dolomite here a piece of uh chert uh looks like a tiny piece of basalt there more basalt there so just that that heterogeneous collection of rocks you typically find in glacial tills coming from a variety of sources uh sometimes it's a few miles away sometimes hundreds of miles away to the north but this this stream valley uh, looks looks a little raw, doesn't it? Um, and that's because uh, during the farming era, there were a variety of changes to the hydrology of landscapes, and sometimes it was just the clearing and plowing of a field, even without putting in tile or, or ditch drainage, even just the clearing of the field. That field uh, in the springtime, when during a hard rain, doesn't the water doesn't soak in very well, it runs off the surface, and that increase in runoff then starts to create this gully. And as the gully grows, uh, the deeper it goes, the more it's pulling water out of, the, out of the surrounding soil. And so it feeds itself uh, and grows even deeper until eventually the grading of this uh, uh, comes into equilibrium, but it's still got a ways to go. You can still see a lot of active cutting. Look at all these small roots exposed just within the last year or two. So this is moving back pretty quickly. That's unfortunately the story that you see repeated over and over again along streams, large streams and small streams in our county because of the tremendous change in the hydrology of landscapes today with the impermeable surface and agricultural drainage. Uh, we simply flush so much water through these stream valleys that it's, uh, yeah, the, the stream valleys themselves change. And so this valley would have been much more shallow, probably no exposure of soil here. Just the swale that water would have run through a few hundred years ago. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, about surface drainage patterns here on the Marengo Moraine and to contrast it with drainage patterns in the rest of the county because this is distinctly different. Uh, if, if, uh, if we were trying to imagine the deposition of the Marengo Moraine, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good analogy for that. If we think of just a big bulldozer pushing ahead and piling up just mounds of this Tiscoa till, this clay loam, really heavy, sticky material, uh, at the same time water pouring off the ice uh, off into the outwash plain to the west. And then the glacier recedes and it leaves this just mound, essentially a big mound of mud. And rains in the, in the centuries after that are just, are just falling on this bare mud and then creating all sorts of rills and gullies in it. And so when we look at the Marengo Moraine today, particularly the topographic map, as you're seeing now, you can see all of those little valleys, uh, some of which continue to develop over the last 20,000 years, but many of which probably had their origin and much of their development almost immediately after the deposition. There's essentially no plants to hold the soil back. Now, that's that in itself, I suppose, is interesting. We want to contrast that with the eastern part of the county. I've got a couple of examples here 
First, there's a landscape immediately northeast of, of Goose Lake where we visited on our last field trip. In fact, uh, we did a little uh, video there where we're looking at eskers in the background, an ice contact landscape. If you look at this map, you can see the letter D marks all the closed depressions. Now here we've got a different sort of phenomenon. And again, I'm gonna to try to come up with a good analogy. Try to imagine the dumping of this glacier material on a landscape with just a lot of big, big and little blocks of ice left behind. And so then as that ice melts, it leaves these depressions behind. So you have this lumpy landscape, not hundreds of feet. The relief isn't hundreds of feet. It's often really rather subtle, but on a small scale, it goes up and down where the ice blocks melt. And so you have kettle holes like the one that Goose Lake occupies and many others in the, uh, in the Hebron Lowland. And when you get up onto the ice contact area, Northeast of there, you're seeing in this map, you can see the, the kettle holes marked by the letter D for depression. And again, if we look at the at the um, the Boone Creek area, we can see just, just peppered with small depressions. Again, another ice contact landscape. So in these areas, you really never had a lot of that surface runoff and the development of that more or less organized drainage pattern. Rather, this the water went into the down into an aquifer there wasn't a lot of surface runoff, and so that topography was created as the ice melted and it sagged into this closed depressions and small hills we call canes and kettles and occasionally leftover stream sediments we now call eskers. So I just wanted to contrast those two. It's really important ecologically because in the eastern part of the county, you'll get this spatial juxtaposition of small kettle wetland next to gravel hill. So you're getting a contrast of standing water to a dry gravel hill over a matter of maybe 20 or 30 meters, really short distances. Here in the western part of the county, we have much of that same diversity, but scaled up. And so the Marengo Moraine is a huge feature, uh, miles wide. Um, and, uh, and this wonderful woodland developed on it. Then the outwash plains to both sides are huge, extensive features that stretch for miles on either side. Again, tremendous diversity, but here played out on a larger scale. So that's really, it's a wonderful thing when you start to study geology and combine it with ecology, you start to appreciate those different scales at which you achieve this sort of ecological diversity in landscapes. We're at the western boundary of the block of woods we've been in for the last hour. Uh, that beautiful oak, oak woodland. And uh, if you go back to the uh, public land survey map, you would have been looking uh, in 1837, you've been looking into more woods and more woods for another mile and a half. By 1939, this was cleared in a farm field and it remains that way today. And so the natural areas we, we preserve and restore today are in a radically different context than they were originally. And so that's really the, the reason why we have to conduct ecological restoration management because of this radically different context, the exotic plants and animals that are constantly coming into the preserves from the outside. And this is just a really stark reminder of that. When you come to the edge of the natural area, we all like to be in the middle, but if you come to the edge and look out, you see the predicament of nature today and the reason why we need to do ecological restoration management. That's the, uh, that's the original landscape of 1837 and the blue, uh, the blue stars where where I'm standing uh, in, in, the, in the video there. So yeah, it was a mile, a mile and a half or so to the edge of the woodland. Um, and, and I don't wanna leave that issue behind. Uh, to, today you can, you can back up a bit and look at where Marengo Ridge sits. Uh, the, the, the issue of, of, uh, of development surrounding natural areas is, is a complex one and it does many Things. One of the things it does is it juxtaposes nature and, uh, and modern human culture. And as we back up a bit, you can start to see the complexity of modern human culture. You can see the north side of the, of the town of Marengo. You can see the many human developments and houses, all of which uh, are probably at least 
well, almost all of which have, you know, exotic plants around them uh, and English sparrows nesting on, on the eaves of the houses. Uh, and so the, the little, the, what is the comparatively little woods of Marengo Ridge seems big when you're standing in the middle of it, but that comparatively little woods is surrounded in a world that's completely, almost completely transformed from the state of the landscape hundreds of years ago. So that little bit of woods that we were in is now in a radically different context and subject to invasion by any number of exotic plants and animals. And as we back up even further, here you can see the whole of the county and the, the ridge is this uh, stripe here through the county. And as we look at that, you can see that would have been one massive dark green stripe if we had had an aerial photograph from 1820. Uh, today you can see that the remnant woods, the dark green, are just little squares here and there. And so you can see both not only is, is, are those fragments of nature uh, surrounded by human development, they're also isolated from each other. And so uh, if you have a small area of woods, and originally it had a species of, it could be a plant or an animal, but a species that was never terribly common, was relatively few in number, and now it's isolated from other members of its own species, uh, natural fluctuations over time, difficult weather years may snuff it out of existence altogether within that small little square. And since there's no way to reinvade, we lose one species. So that's the, that's the difficulty of reducing natural areas to small islands in, in a developed context is that over time, just natural fluctuations in populations, much less the invasion by exotics and other human disturbances, leads to the local extirpation of species from these areas and they just become more and more species poor. So that's, that's, a, that's an important part of why we do ecological restoration today. Uh, and you don't, you don't see it quite as much when you stand in the middle of a natural area like we all like to do, like I like to do, uh, and, and, uh, and try to forget about what else, what's outside of it. You know, I've been coming to Marengo Ridge for about 15 years. Uh, and from my very first visit uh, to today, this has always been one of my favorite, perhaps my absolute favorite site in the entire Conservation District holdings. And I can't quite describe why that is, but I've always felt a sense of, uh, well, I don't know what it is, belonging, uh, calm as I walk through these woods here. And uh, I felt it again today and I hope to feel it every time I come here from now on. So it's just, uh, I'm glad I could share this with you today. You should all try to come out here for a walk on your own. But uh, I think right now we need to get back to the cars. It's time, all, all the good things come to an end. This field trip has to come to an end. So goodbye for now. There, there's a, when I started work in the early 90s, uh, I heard this expression around the Morton Arboretum, and that was the, uh, the oh my plant, uh, that when you went out in the woods, what you were looking for were unusual things, the oh my plants, and not just um, um, the common plants that seem to be everywhere. You were looking for the special ones. Um, well, those of you who are well-versed in, in uh, local botany will have noticed that I really didn't mention any oh my plants today. Uh, maybe with the exception of uh, oak milkweed, which is relatively rare. It's not super rare, but it's relatively rare. And it's always nice to see those things you don't see very commonly. Uh, but I, you know, I, 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 I could have scoured the woods and I would have found a few rare things and I could have taken you from one rare thing to the next as, as I often had botanists do with me in the early 90s. But rather what I really wanted to do is present the places that would appear to you as you walk in the woods and explain how and why it looks as it does today. Um, that, that focus on rare species, I think, is important because the preservation of rare species is important to conservation. But it, it can lead to a sort of myopic focus on rare things that makes us all into list makers. Um, and we turn places like Marengo Ridge into lists of, of species of this or that. And we scan through the list looking for things that are rare and valuable. But, but these, these places are much more the containers of species and their worth is not tallied just in a bunch of lists. All of us um, were raised in a culture of objects and we 
you look through the objects and we list them and we separate the valuable objects from the not valuable objects. Uh, and we need to learn to live in a culture of places uh, and that will take a lot of intentional effort on our part. Um, and neither is Marengo or Reggio Rea a remnant of primeval past. Um, there are lots of ways in which it has changed today. It was changed by human cultures over thousands of years. It was changed by human cultures during the agricultural era. Now it's being changed by the culture of conservation. I, I wouldn't um, begin to, to present the woods to you as some, uh, some isolated remnant of, of a savanna, oak, oak woodland savanna from, from the 18th century. It's, it's not that. My fascination and enjoyment of the place is partly understandable. I'm a lover of trees, I'll admit to that. I, that, that was my, the origin of my love of nature was the love of trees. And there's lots and lots of trees in Marengo Ridge and a lot of lovely diversity of trees and other woody plants. So I love it for that reason. Um, but I suspect mostly Marengo Ridge simply reminds me of places in my past. Uh, the reason why I get a sense of calm there and a sense of belonging uh, is, isn't something I put my femora, finger on. It's just a memory of that's familiar and comforting. And, and, and such, uh, such relationships, I think, are not quantifiable. But I think they're real and very powerful and, and, uh, and probably closer to the, to the reason why we do the things we do as conservationists than lists of species. And I'll leave it there for today. And thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on the trip with me. I always love field trips. And this is my first, uh, well, not my first virtual trip. We did one a couple of weeks ago, but this one was a bit different for me. So thank you for coming. And uh, I'll take uh, any questions you have now. Hey, Tom. Yes, Joe. Uh, do trees have life expectancies? Uh, yes, they do. I mean, trees, uh, that's, that's a good question. I could talk to that for about an hour, but I'll try to give you a, a, sh a shorter answer. Uh, trees, uh, um, some species are very short lived, like box elders. You know, I, I, I imagine there are box elders that grow to more than 100 years old, but the usual ones are starting to fall apart. 60 or 70 years, they grow very fast. They produce abundant seed, they reproduce very aggressively, and then they die relatively young. Um, trees uh, have a sort of dead end uh, life cycle in the sense that they get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's how trees grow, how they live, is they have to get bigger every year. They have to add twigs, they have to la add another layer of wood. And so the plant has to get bigger and bigger and bigger which means it's supporting a larger and larger living mass, and yet um, it can't keep up with that. Eventually, trees get too big. They get too tall and they can't get water to their tops, so in, in difficult times and drought periods, they start to die. That can take 60 years or it can take 4,000 years if you're a bristlecone pine in the Rocky Mountains, but, but they have a dead-end growth strategy. I mean, to say it's dead-end doesn't mean it's not successful. Trees covered much of the, uh, dry land portions of the earth uh, in the past. So it's a very successful growth strategy, but all of them have, 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 a, have, a, have a life horizon and, and there is an end to that. Uh, it can be thousands of years or it can be a few decades, but they all have a, 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 a sort of limit to that life. And it's interestingly, if things like basswood, I saw you saw in the, in the presentation today, basswood you can, uh, or the old world versions of that called lime or, or, or uh, yeah, I think it was lime. If you keep cutting it down, it will keep sprouting back. And so it never gets very big. You could do that. Probably you could keep a basswood alive for thousands of years if you just kept cutting it and it kept coming back because it never gets old in the way an old tree that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually gets infected by fungus and eventually runs into a drought period and can't feed its top and, and starts to die. So you can, keep, uh, you can keep some woody plants alive essentially forever by just cutting them back or burning them back to the ground. We don't know how old uh, some of our shrubs are. They probably aren't, but they could be thousands of years old. There's nothing about them that eventually tells them they're just too old. They don't have a life cycle like a person. You eventually just get old and and not that I'm getting old, but um, some of us, some people do. Uh, so that's a, it's a, it's a fun question. Think, uh, plants like trilliums could live forever. Nothing about a trillium that ever gets old. 
the place where it's growing will probably eventually uh, change in some way that will kill that individual plant. But uh, but trees have a sort of dead end strategy. If you just let them go, they'll they'll get bigger and they have to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually they just could get too big and, and die. But that can take many thousands of years for some species and only a few decades for others. One other comment. Uh... You could take uh, slippery elm and you can include that in that peanut butter that. Uh, <laughs> you could have gooey, gooey, slippery elm. Right, right. Elm additives to peanut butter to make it even gooier. Right. Take it easy. Thanks. We want a fun piece of trivia. The oldest tree in the world uh, is 5,062 years old in the White Mountains in California. It's a uh, old Great Basin bristlecone pine. You know, they're not even particularly large, so uh, not quite as breathtaking as the giant sequoia, which are young guys, you know, only three or 4,000 years old. Uh, we had a question. Did the Kishwaukee River form similar to the Kankakee Torrent or the Lake Missoula floodwaters that created the channeled scablands in Washington? That is, did the glacial meltwaters back up from Barlina and Woodstock Moraines? to a great depth, and then blow through the Marengo Moraine to form the Kishwaukee River outlet? Or well, was it more subtle? That's a great question. That, that phenomena has been played out actually a number of times in, in glacial landscapes. I don't think there's any, when you're looking for evidence of that, you're looking for, uh, for evidence of very high velocity water flow. I work in, a, in, a, in an area in the upper peninsula of Michigan called the Huron Mountains, where at lower elevations it was shaped by an immediate post-glacial flood and there were boulders the size of automobiles that had been rolled around and moved and piled up in places and that's what you're looking for if you're looking for a catastrophic uh, flood deposits like the scabons. I haven't been to the scabons. I've read a lot about them. Uh, so we don't see that uh, in the case of the Kishwaukee River. Probably as the glacier was pulling back it was starting to the gap that is now the Kishwaukee Gap was starting to form it, so there was never a really high backup of water behind that. At least as far as I know, there's no evidence of a catastrophic flow of water there, a more, a, a more controlled erosion of, 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 the, of, the, of the moraine as the water was, outwashed water was opening up probably a you know, larger and larger uh, channel, uh, what's, what's now the Kishwaukee Channel that cuts through the Marengo Moraine. So, Great question. Uh, maybe we could take a field trip to the Huron Mountains where I was in the late 80s and I can show you some catastrophic flood deposits, but not, not here. Any other questions out there? It is past time, so if you have to go, you're welcome to do that, but we'll stay on here as long as people have things to ask. Interesting uh, story about the uh, scab lands and catastrophic floods. The person who first wrote about them was named Bretz, Harlan Bretz, and he started off in the Chicago area and did several really good books uh, on the geology of Chicago region, uh, one on hard rock geology, one on glacial geology. I have copies in my office at work. Uh, it's no longer in print, but it's a wonderful read. He was a good writer. And he went out to uh, Washington and was the first one to theorize the, uh, the, the, uh, because no one really thought in terms of catastrophic causes in geology, C catastrophism was, was, uh, was rejected by geologists for the most part, and Brett's sort of bucking that trend when he theorized this huge uh, um, glacial massive flood that had created the scab land. So a little, a little Chicago tie-in on that. And another question in the chat. When you say poke milkweed, are you referring to the plant that's also called pokeweed? No, no, that's a good question. Pokeweed is a is a common annual weed. It's a native weed. Uh, you know, it's hard to know with some of those weeds where they fit into a landscape 500 years ago, but probably uh, just occasional disturbances here and there. They may have followed a human, set, you know, small human uh, indigenous people settlements around uh, but it's a it's a rather attractive uh, weed with uh, with very tiny black berries. Um, um, they, um, the young leaves of that can be eaten as a salad. 
those people as old as I am remember the song Poke Salad Annie. That one comes from pokeweed. But poke milkweed is a different, I don't know where the, the word poke is common between the two. I don't know where that comes from, but poke milkweed is a, is a different plant, a relative, relatively uncommon native milkweed of our woodlands. Hey, Tom, I have a, a thought. You said how you feel at home uh, in the woods, uh, how you feel yeah. better. I, I see Ginny says she feels similar, and so do I. And my question or my thought is that has, has the species, has our race, human race, have, are we unnatural? Are we living unnaturally? Have we evolved like, you know, should we be replanted in the forest as native plants? Or well, that's a, well, that's a, you know, I can always count on you, Joe, for a deep question. Uh, okay. You know, I, I think there's been a lot, of, there was a lot of speculation going back to my days in college about, about human beings evolving on the savannas of Africa and all that, but the savannas of Africa are quite different from Marengo Ridge. Uh, I'm, I tend to, I mean, I, my, my take on that is, first of all, I think, yeah, we have certainly put ourselves in a very odd situation today, a situation that's really very different, even from the human past of a few thousand years ago, which is a pretty small amount of time. Well, so in that sense, we are, maybe we are sort of out of place. Uh, I tend to think my, my, affections are more influenced by just childhood and in, in forests and being a shy kid that liked to get off in the woods and uh it's peaceful and uh quiet and yeah I, I, and you know my work as a graduate student all those things i can't there's the most important things about your past is the other things you can't remember it's part of you that just shapes you that that uh, is a part of you and it causes you to see the world in a way that is yours alone. And for me, when I, when I, when I leave the parking lot, or walk in the woods, it's just a certain feeling. It's reminding me of something. I, I can't recall exactly what that is, but it's, it's important, whatever it is for me. What I was thinking, you know, after 50 years of working, uh, you've, your, Jackie and Lori, and your life, your style of living is more natural than mine. I lived inside a, a cab of a truck and I'm just thinking now that I've retired that human beings were never we were never meant to work that way we should have all become park rangers or something <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's like I said when I get outside I think my god I wasted my whole life sitting within working within four walls we weren't meant to do that well, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of roles for people in society and a lot of roles that need to be filled. I mean, my, my goal as a teacher is not to, not to make everyone into a park ranger, then we wouldn't have anyone to pay the park rangers. But uh, yeah, it's to just open up a world that is, is, is new to people that didn't, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I was 30 years old when I went back to school and started studying ecology. I had a different life before that. Uh, and but the life that's opened up since then is just one I want to make people familiar with. I mean, it's added so much to my life that I wanted it to make it to make it available to other people. That's my goal as an educator and as a conservationist because I think that that familiarity is the real root. That's 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 what we go back to when we want to conserve and preserve and restore nature. It's not fancy, it's not philosophical, it is, it is, it is deep down in the core of who we are and what we love, uh, that's, and, and that shapes us, and that's, that's where, our, where our urge to conserve comes from, and that's why I want to get people in touch with it uh, as much as I can. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kind of related to that, but I, I like to listen to some health and fitness podcasts, but it's interesting how it bleeds even into that arena. There's a whole set of nutritional anthropology of like how the foods we've eaten, or how like historically what the natural history is of the foods we eat, how that impacts our health now, or even just the studies on you know, like people healing faster if the paint on the wall is green versus gray. So it impacts us in so many different ways that we don't even realize.
Well, if anyone has any other questions, now is your chance. Otherwise, we'll be wrapping up here shortly. Well, I want to thank everyone, everybody for coming again today. I really enjoy these. I mean, that's, uh, this whole uh, webinar effort has been initially very strange, starting to become more familiar, but I, I enjoy seeing you all, even if it's only in a virtual sense. Uh, and I will uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Have a good day.